Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the title of this talk is The Witty Museum Collection and Legendary Curators. Uh, we have two legendary curators with us right now. Usually you're called legendary after you, you know, go off, uh, as my grandmother used to say, up or down. But, um, <laughs> but we have two curators that are legendary in their time. So, and I will be introducing them. I just need a quick background at the Witty Museum, and this is another time today that we make a case for the Witty Museum as the museum that hosts this fabulous um, exhibition, uh, The Art of Texas, 250 Years. I I'm sorry, I should have introduced myself. Maurice McDermott, I'm president and CEO of the Witty Museum, and so proud to be here um, representing the Witty and its astonishing history, not just his, not only history of history, but also the history of Texas art. Um, Ellen S. Coolen, the, the founding director of the Witty Museum, um, really had a vision for a regional museum, but she saw it not regional in the way, you know, we've learned from Francine and others that is small, but large. She did not want a museum that was just another American Museum of Natural History. She was very emphatic about that. She wanted a museum that had a sense of place, that, um, that had artists and historians and uh, artifacts that represented this place we now call Texas. She recognized that if for, throughout its, uh, its history or prehistory, it wasn't always called Texas, so she was really wonderful about sending people down to the Rio Grande, um, in, in, one in which one case, Virginia Carson, who was a watercolorist, who um, was the first one to record the rock art narratives uh, that uh, Amy has sent off to Boston to get conserved, 118 of those watercolors. Um, so that an artist was on, the, on staff. Uh, Mrs. Quillen had hired an artist, Virginia Carson, on staff to go down and, um, and, and kind of replicate those. Um, so art has always been the center. And then Eleanor Onderdonk, who was the, and this is where Amy comes in, the uh, curator from 1927 to 1958, was so fundamental in growing the Texas art. And, and again, Amy has done so much work on Eleanor Onderdonk, and that's what you're going to hear uh, from her today. And um, uh, so, and, and, and I think you'll be very pleased. At, I've learned so much from Amy's uh, study of Eleanor Onderdonk and, and what Eleanor has contributed, not only to the Whitty Museum, but to Texas art and then uh, Texas art as American art. Um, and then Martha Utterbeck, who was uh, chosen as the curator of Texas art, or art rather, after Eleanor left in 1958. So here you are, and you know, when we, we just, follow Martha around, and Amy knows this, if we have a question, we say, we'll just need to call Martha. And when you call Martha, you get everything you could possibly want and more because your knowledge is so vast. And after Martha left, the witty went to, I mean, I'm gonna read your bio, but went off to um, be the assistant uh, director at the DRT, I'm gonna read that formally. But then, Ella, who came along, but Cecilia Steinfeld, who had been a curator for a long time, but took over this place that you created, Martha, which is um, Texas Art. So I'm gonna hold up a book here, which is uh, Cecilia's book of the, tex of the uh, Witty's collection, um, Art for History's Sake, the Texas Collection of the Witty Museum. Some of these paintings actually ended up at the art museum, that Boo Hauser knows very well. He was the, I think he's here today, and yes, was on the board of trustees during that period. Um, so this is a more complicated s story about this, but this is a seminal uh, work, um, and actually Ron Tyler was uh, the one who arranged for it, um, and it was actually uh, underwritten by the Summerlee Foundation, and I know John Crane is here. Uh, I remember having lunch with Cecilia and Ron and, uh, and you, John, uh, over many books, including the Seymour Thomas book, so that you underwrote, so very critical. I mean, these are the critical leaders in the audience to make sure that the Witty Museum sustained its power as a center of Texas art. So thank you all for all your leadership and, and uh, support. So with that, I'm going to introduce our two speakers who will talk more about, Amy will talk about Eleanor Onderdonk the Witty Museum, and uh, Martha will talk about Theodore Gentil um, as a uh, curator at the Witty Museum. Uh, Amy Fulkerson is chief curator of the Witty Museum now, and she oversees a collection of more than 300 
1,000 artifacts and 5,000 feet of library and archives. Um, with 20 years of experience, uh, Amy draws upon a strong foundation of preservation and collection management. She's just astonishing how much she knows. Um, she works in collaboration with curatorial collection and education staff to increase access to the rich and diverse resources of the Witte's collection through exhibitions and vis visible storage, really a highly unusual visible storage in the B. Naylor Morton Research and Collection Center. And Amy has, um, has volunteered to take you through that collection, that visible storage at our research center, which is south of the museum, between the last lecture and uh, the reception, if you would like to do that. Um, and she was the director of that a change. Um, and then uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Amy is also curates exhibitions and specialties of Texas art, circus history, fiesta, and she serves on the board of the Center for Advancement and Study of Early Texas Art. I can tell you one thing that's really critical, of course, that Bruce Shackford and um, Catherine Nelson Hall are here, uh, both Texas Heritage and he Texas History curators, so we all did this together, mostly them. We had to pack up all 300,000 of those artifacts to move out of this building when we did the transformation. And so we all worked for General Amy um, <laughs> for about a year. Uh, so that was a gargantuan task and uh, well done. Uh, we now have an offsite storage that, again, um, we would be happy to take you privately uh, with arrangement. It, it's, it, it, you know the, the, the uh, scene in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, where, the, right, when you, that's the way this is, it's fabulous. <laughs> Um, then Martha, the genius of Theatre Gentil. Martha Utterback will describe her efforts to find out more about the life of the early Texas artist Theodore Gentil in his native France and the colony of Castroville. You'll hear about this. Uh, Martha retired in 2016 as assistant director of the Daughters of the Republic of Texas Library at the Alamo, where she worked primarily with photograph and art holdings, which include two important collections of the work of Theodore Gentil. In previous years, she was curator of art at the Witte Museum, responsible with the San Antonio Art League for exhibitions presented in the Witte Museum's art galleries. And between those long-term uh, opportunities, she worked with a team at the Truman Presidential Library on plans to renovate the library, uh, museum, exhibitions, and with the Texas Commission on the Arts and Humanities as director of Texas Museum Consortium Project. And so with that, uh, first we will be hearing from Chief Curator at the Witte, Amy Fulkerson. put these on, I'm not going to be able to see a thing, so. <laughs> I hope everybody has been enjoying the conference so far. Um, we've had some wonderful speakers, and I am very pleased to be able to be a part of this lovely group. Um, as Marie said, I have been studying Eleanor Onderdonk and looking at her particular legacy, not just as an artist, but as a curator, and her impact on Texas art as a whole um, in her role in nurturing uh, younger artists who were coming along in the field, but also in putting forward amazing exhibitions and the work that she did here at the Witte Museum. And so, as we look back at, at Eleanor, one of the first things that we need to remember is that she's coming from uh, a family of artists. And as Cecilia Steinfeld wrote in her uh, book in 1975 on the Onderdonks, a family of painters, she traces the, the early life of, of Eleanor, her father, Robert Onderdonk, and her brother, Julian. And it's very evident in the, the story that Cecilia weaves of the, about the family is that Julian was always sort of expected to go into the artistic field. But Eleanor did not have that same sort of career path already mapped out for her. And for the most part, She's uninterested in art until much later. And in Eleanor's letters and diaries, it's 1909, right when her brother comes back from school in New York uh, with his young family, that Eleanor writes that she has started to sketch and draw all day. And so this is the beginning sort of of her own artistic awakening, of her expressing herself through art for the first time. 
And she's an incredible artist. And these are just samples of some of those early sketches and drawings. And what she is best known for are her miniatures. And so in 1913, she did an exhibition at the newly founded San Antonio Art League and exhibited three of her miniature portraits. And they were written up with great success in the, the local papers. And she decided that she would go to study at the Art Students League in New York, just as her father and her brother had done. And she returns to, to great fanfare doing several exhibitions here in San Antonio. But life changes for, for Eleanor after her father passes away. And she finds herself taking over her father's um, students, taking on his classes, which was really never quite the right fit for Eleanor. Uh, while she was a gifted artist, uh, teaching was not necessarily her cup of tea. And in 1927, Eleanor comes to the, the Witte Museum uh, as a curator here, and she's here f until 1958. And she really shaped the early years of the Witte's exhibitions and the growth of our collection. Now, in these days, Eleanor had sort of two masters. She worked for both the Witte Museum, who paid her salary, gave her her office, and then there was the San Antonio Art League that set the schedule of exhibitions. And this was a pattern that carried out all the way through Martha's time here at the Witte Museum. The, there were two collections that were being grown in parallel. There was the Witte Museum collection, there was the San Antonio Art League collection. And Eleanor floated between those two worlds quite efficiently. One of her first jobs when she uh, came to um, the, the Witte Museum was the, to arrange an exhibition of works by Diego Rivera and his group from Mexico City. And if you can imagine, it's her first few months as a curator. And uh, this is sort of my worst nightmare, putting together a, a large exhibition, uh, thinking of you know all the work that it went into arranging for the, the Art of Texas. Eleanor arranges for this show of more than 200 paintings and drawings, it's quite a large show, and the artwork gets lost. And so as it's coming from Mexico City uh, to San Antonio, it disappears without a trace. It's in the paper that this uh, major exhibition has gone missing, and it was gone for more than two weeks. They eventually are able to recover the artwork and stage the show here in San Antonio. And this is one of the, the early exhibitions of Rivera's work in the United States. And what do they write about in San Antonio? They could care less for Diego Rivera after all that hard work and heartache. What they did write about was Emily Edwards, who was a, a young woman from San Antonio who had been studying R Rivera in his circle. And they thought her work was fantastic, but the rest of it they could leave. So after this sort of major uh, trial by fire in Eleanor's life, she starts to, to focus in a bit more on San Antonio and Texas artists. And she's arranging exhibitions on quite a large scale. Uh, the museum was not as big as it is now, but she was using all of the available art space and, and gallery space here. She did uh, more than 121 uh, painting exhibition focusing on the Texas Hill Country, but she was also part of the, she was one of the, the chief organizers of the Davis competitions from 1927 to 1929, and then goes on to become part of uh, a group of organizers with James Chilman and uh, Jerry Bywaters on the Texas Annual Exhibition. And these are incredibly influential in how we started to define Texas art, uh, what it meant to, to be an artist in the state of Texas. It was a seal of approval to be selected for these annual exhibitions. And the organization of these shows uh, traded between the three museums, the, the Dallas Museum of Art, the, the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, and the Witte Museum. And in 1932, Eleanor did her first uh, round as the, the chairman 
of this uh, exhibition and, and going back and looking at our archives, it was wonderful to see how many names in that early exhibition are in the Art of Texas. Uh, many of the artists who were uh, part of these annual exhibitions very early on are artists that have stood the test of time. These are, are artists that are hanging on the walls in our, our gallery now, and you can see many of them here. Uh, we've got a great list, uh, Mary Bonner, Charles Bowling, Adele Brune, Ola McNeil Davidson, Emma Richardson Cherry, Otis Dozier, Edward Eisenlohr, Alexander Hoag, uh, Corinne Spellman, Ruth Pershing Euler, and Julius Woltz. But Eleanor was uh, not just looking for these annual exhibitions, she was always on the lookout for people who were quite talented but didn't quite make the cut just yet. And she often would nurture the careers of young artists and if they didn't make the cut for the annual exhibition, she might offer them a show here at the Witty. She was changing out exhibitions sometimes as, as rapidly as every two weeks and could offer small shows to artists who were starting out in their careers. And this was incredibly uh, generous and influential to have an opportunity to say you were exhibited at a museum. And so some of the artists that are in the Art of Texas that uh, Eleanor offered either their first museum exhibition or their first one-person show include Julius Woltz. Uh, we've got this beautiful branding scene at Cathedral Mountain in the exhibition, um, Atavia Marillin, and Forrest Bess. Now Bess had exhibited before he was here at the Witty, but he was offered his first one-man show here at the, the, the Witty Museum, and he becomes very close friends with Eleanor Onderdonk. And one of the, the great things that I've had the, the pleasure of doing is uh, going through their correspondence. And they corresponded uh, throughout um, the, the rest of Eleanor's life. And they would write about all sorts of topics. And Eleanor was the, the type of person that uh, she didn't go to you, you came to her. Uh, and while she could be a, a great one for offering advice, uh, she was always tempered. She was always very moderate. And so when we see Forrest Bess's letters, um, he's always very excited. He wants to talk about art. He wants to talk about what it means to be an artist. He's sketching for her. He's sending her works of art. Uh, he's asking her advice on the shows that he's doing in New York. Uh, he even sent her a drawing of the home and studio that he was building. And all of these are part of the, the Witty's archives. And Eleanor's letters in return were often maybe just a paragraph or two always addressing the topic that he had written to her about, but always much more moderated, but singularly encouraging of his work and of his career. Now, another important part of Eleanor's time here at the, the Witty Museum was building a collection. And so with the San Antonio Art League, many of the, the pieces were coming in through uh, purchase prizes at uh, their annual exhibitions. But the Witty's collection was funded in part through a generous gift of Alfred Witty. And when the Witty Museum was established, $10,000 was set aside for purchases uh, in an endowment. And some of the early purchases that Eleanor added to the, the Witty's collection include pieces in The Art of Texas. And here we see um, Mission San Jose by Seth Eastman. And this is a piece that she purchased from Eastman's nephew. And as an artist herself, and as the family member of, of artists, she was often able to approach families that hadn't necessarily considered selling, or if they were, they were selling because they were in dire financial straits. And she could talk to them in a way that understood what it meant to grow up in an artistic family, what it meant to sometimes struggle with not being able to, to make ends meet. And she negotiated wonderful purchases for the Witty's collection to say that these are pieces that need to be preserved and shared. She also made this wonderful purchase for the, the Witty's collection from Thomas Allen's daughter. This is Market Plaza. This is Oxcart uh, Leaving Town by Theodore Gentil on the trail, 
and gifts that were made from local families here in San Antonio, um, Ivonsky's Terry Rangers, another good friend who contributed an entire portfolio uh, through his relationship with uh, uh, Eleanor was uh, Buck Shewitz. And then another piece that she brought into the collection is one of my favorite Mary Bonners. Uh, it may not be quite as exciting as some of her others. It's not one of the hand-colored etchings. Uh, but this was signed by Mary Bonner to Mrs. Drought, uh, who was a local patron of the arts here in San Antonio. And I love this piece because she does this right as they're uncovering the, the murals in Crete. And this is inspired by those murals that were being uncovered. And to see her responding to world events and to, if you go through your, your art history textbooks and you see that wonderful scene of the youth vaulting over the bull, this is Mary Bonner's interpretation of that. And here she does, um, she copies the frieze that's on the, the mural from Crete, but what I love that she did that's really sneaky and why it's called Map of the World is when that mural was uncovered, the background was modeled, it wasn't filled in, but she takes that disorder and creates order. And in the background of these, feature, of these figures, you can actually see where she shaped them into the continents, and it's the map of the world. So maybe not quite as showy, but one of my favorite stories. And Ms. Eleanor, um, you can see here working with uh, the collection, um, had tremendous um, importance both to the, the, the witty and to uh, uh, the, the, te the Texas art scene. She is someone that I'm continuing to, to, to research and to learn more about. Uh, she was a remarkable uh, woman. Um, and I think it's important that we recognize the people who are building the collections, the people who saved some of these pieces so that uh, they're here for posterity, um, to recognize that um, you know we have wonderful collectors who are sharing their knowledge, and she was just collecting on a larger scale here at the, the museum. And uh, I hope in the future to be able to share more information uh, about Miss Eleanor uh, with you as I continue to, to do my research. Uh, the largest public collections of Theodore Gentile's work are still here at the Witte Museum and in the Daughters of the Republic of Texas Library here in town. Um, the Witte began collecting uh, Gentile's paintings in 1937, uh, directly from the uh, surviving niece who had inherited them from Gentile. And uh, they, they had just been in, in the family hands for probably 30 years before, they, before the niece began selling them. But and th these uh, paintings that I'll show you are, the, are among those first ones that the, that the witty selected. I think they were part of the selections made uh, with the niece, Louise Fretelier, and of course with Eleanor Onderdonk, and also with Mrs. Quillen. I think she had a hand in, in uh, some of these first selections, this uh, really splendid painting. And, uh, and then they, I'm, I'm sure Mrs. Quillen had a voice in this in, in getting the Indian paintings here in, at the Witte. Uh, at the same time, the Witte was buying in 1937 
an organiz local organization called the Yanaguana Society was also buying. They had, uh, they really uh, sort of instigated an interest in collecting Gentile's paintings because they recognized that uh, they were really uh, historic records that needed to stay in San Antonio. So they uh, began raising funds and, and their members began buying paintings at the same time. And uh, these are, of course, the Fandango is, is one of them that the Yanaguana so Society selected and, and the a little uh, a funeral of an angel here in San Antonio on North Flores Street uh, was another. The, the, uh, the Yanaguana Society then in about 10 years later, when they dissolved, they gave their entire collection to the Daughters of the Republic of Texas and rather than to the Witte Museum. And there's a whole story behind that too, but, but mainly uh, the, the Daughters, uh, the local chapter of the Daughters had made Alamo Hall, which had just been uh, constructed in about um, uh, 1939, they made it available to uh, the society to show the paintings. The society was having a hard time finding a place, uh, a, a permanent place to show their paintings. And the daughters were very uh, gracious to them and, uh, and they liked the way they were handling the paintings. And so when the time came to uh, place their whole collection, they placed it uh, in the library rather than, rather than in the museum. Okay, that takes care of the politics of that. <laughs> and uh, and, um, and, and the, but that the daughters had this very fine collection. One of the, I should say that one of the um, provisions of that gift was that the paintings would hang in perpetuity in the library. And we tried uh, against all <laughs> practical considerations to do that. Uh, I was at the library for a full 36 years and I don't believe we ever lent those paintings out. We really tried to, to uh, honor that agreement with the society. Not out of fear that the witty would come and get them, but, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, okay. In, in the 1960s, uh, the library expanded its collection by purchasing uh, family papers that had also been in the family uh, for all those years. And uh, they were just a mixed, a mixed bag of, uh, of a collection. But uh, within those papers are many of the preliminary drawings for Jean Thiel's oil paintings. And they are so detailed that they really give an idea of, of how he worked and the, the extent to which he planned before he painted, uh, before he did any of the canvas paintings. And this is one of those that, that is in that collection. And uh, let's see, I think we skipped two. There are two that didn't, didn't make the cut here. I think maybe they were too pale, but they were, uh, they're, uh, of, they were prelim preliminary drawings of some of the paintings that Jean Thiel did that, uh, that we've never found, that we've never located the paintings. And so within this same collection, there are uh, uh, sketches and uh, tracings for paintings that, uh, they're the only images that we have that, that show what these paintings might look like if, if they ever turn up. There are a whole group of them, maybe about a dozen paintings uh, that are on <coughs> John Teal's list, but have not been located. Okay. 
finally, in that same collection are uh, Theodore Jean Thiel's writings about his own education in Paris. He attended the uh, Royal School of, uh, the Royal Free School of Drawings and Mathematics in Paris. Uh, he was a student in the years 1835 and 1836 that we have a record of. He may have been there in, in some of the preceding years, but we know he was there in those years because he won some awards and there's still uh, documents that, uh, that list the awards he won. And the, this building still stands on the left bank in Paris and the, the round dome is, is where the students uh, uh, had their classes. It, the, the dome had been uh, constructed for uh, a medical school that had preceded the art school, and it was the, the surgical theater that, uh, and then the, uh, the art school, when it, when it took over, uh, that's where the students worked and, and, and where they studied. Uh, why also, his, his art education in Paris uh, continued uh, in, the, in the studio of uh, an artist, Raymond uh, Monvoisson, and this is a, his sketch for a little painting that he did of that studio. There's just this, this one sketch and the one painting that records uh, the, uh, this additional time that he spent in Paris. Let's see, there's finally, I'm, I think something else is skipped too. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll go back to the school because this is, this is where the lessons are that uh, when, when Jean Thiel was studying, the, the principal method of studying was copying, and that has so much uh, bearing on the work he did in, in his mature years. The students were, uh, had their workbenches, and on the workbenches, uh, they had, uh, uh, they, they had <coughs> uh, prints uh, attached. There was a little frame for each workbench, and in the frame was a, was a, a, a print, usually an engraving, that they were re required to copy. And uh, what they were doing, they were preparing for, uh, for work that would uh, uh, prepare them to help in the to help in the production of, of the decorative arts rather than fine arts. So these, these are, are, are later paintings, of course, of Chantilles, but uh, that have to do with uh, preparing floral designs for uh, production of porcelains. Here are two of his, his later paintings. Or, uh, or, uh, ornamental designs for, um, for embellishments of architecture or of furnishings. And I'm afraid that we're skipping a lot of things here, but this is one of his early, uh, early drawings that, is, that dates from Paris, we think. It's, it's not for certain, but if you can see his, his uh, um, his own um, autograph down at the bottom, his identification. It, it, that's just not uh, anything that we ever see in more recent years. Uh, but the but the painting of, of the but the drawing of the horse does look like something that he probably would have drawn in in class. And certainly the uh, the picture of the the the. Uh, drawing of the, the rider is, is not anything like he did in later years, so it's entirely different. 
these are kind of backwards. So this is this is the one that this is the this is the kind of uh, print that that the uh, that the students would copy. This would be something that he would copy, and then this would be something that he might have produced then. getting into things. Let's see. Let me see. These are these are a little out of order, so I need, I need to. Um, I'm supposed to be talking about some things that he learned in in the school. Some very specific. Um, some very specific ways of. Of, of showing three dimensions on, on a two-dimensional uh, plane. And this is, this is the expert one, and this is supposed to come after some of the others. But, but he learned, uh, they learned to do uh, either a blended shading uh, with charcoal to show three dimensions, to show form, or a line drawing that would be a series of parallel lines done in either graphite, usually, or pen and ink that, would, that he would show, that a student might show uh, to, do a, to show the form. This is, I think, that his, his best use of it was with this in, in watercolor, which would be much more difficult uh, using a brush, a fine brush, and still, as you see the, in the face, there are lines. It's not, uh, it's not blended shading so much as it's lines, even lines crossed a little bit, so that it, uh, he does the very careful and sensitive uh, portrait. This is a self-portrait of the artist at the age of 45. It was uh, done in 1864. Let me see if I... And another use of this, uh, the form that's called hatching, is is uh, he used it to to show the uh, to show mainly uh, the shadows in in his uh, in, in preliminary drawings as far as oil paintings, and this was one that was very clear. It, the sh the little shadows are kind of kind of odd looking. They have a little life of their own, but, but they're to, sh to be sure that he uh, shows that this is, uh, this is midday and, and this is going to be the painting for that. And I think we skipped a whole series of things here. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I still have some more. You still have some more. Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> okay. Um, in in 1864, when he went at the same time he had done that self portrait, he he had also done um, a series of watercolors that he he formed into an album. Uh, before the album was. Uh, taken apart and the individual watercolors uh, uh, framed. Uh, Carmen Perry, who was uh, uh, at that time was uh, the librarian at the DRT library, had access to all of these little paintings and she recorded exactly what the artist had written on the backs and on the mats, uh, and and he was very careful about showing what his sources were. I mean, he never uh, tried to uh, show something that was a copy, say, uh, when it was really a composition, and vice versa. And this, on this one, he had the words uh, in French uh, that it was after nature. And this, this is a little painting of, of Flores Street in San Antonio, where he lived. Uh, and 
and it's definitely one of his few that we can be sure was a, a watercolor painting on site. And this one uh, was a copy, and it and uh, he makes clear on on the designation that it was a, a copy after an engraving. And this, he, he used the word composition, which meant that it was something he composed. He didn't uh, copy it from anything, from uh, nature or, or uh, from an engraving. And this, this is, uh, I just wanted to show this in particular because it, it's one of his finest uh, watercolors of a, of a landscape. It was also uh, a part of one of the uh, of this uh, album of watercolors, and he didn't designate. I don't believe he designated the source of this, but uh, in searching later, this this is what we know that he copied. It's it's a it's a woodcut that was in a in a French periodical uh, in 1853. And it's by an artist, uh, Claude Daubigny. Um, uh, I know Charles Francois Daubigny, who was a, a, an important artist of the Barbizon school that preceded Impressionism. And he was of the same generation as Jean Thiel. And Daubigny made the woodcut uh, from his own painting, oil painting. And this was an important painting that was shown in the Paris salons and was first uh, purchased by Napoleon III. And eventually it made its way to the Cincinnati Art Museum and, and that's where it is today. But we can be sure that Jean Thiel never saw the original painting. Let's see what else. I think, okay, <laughs> I think that we can, um, as, as we get more acquainted with Jean Thiel's paintings, uh, this is one that we can look at and be fairly sure that it's, it is a copy. And it's because the figures are so natural, they're very uh, relaxed, they, um, they look, look like human figures should look like. And this, on the other hand, is, is a composition. I think we can be sure that these, these paintings, uh, you, can, you can see the stiffness in the, in the, in the human figures. The, the horses are fine, but the human figures are always a little stiff and a little awkward. And also any, any of the oil paintings that show active movement, uh, such as this one. And, uh, well, let's see. And that, that just shows the extent to which he was working to try to get everything just right, including the colors of the horses. And of course, this is the watermelon race and uh, it, it's an original painting. And this is, the photograph indicates that he was gonna have a photograph made of this. And this finally is uh, a, a, an entirely different source that he began using in the 1880s. And uh, this is a beautiful painting of Concepcion Mission. And, and we know that he painted it uh, from this photograph. He didn't, uh, he didn't apologize, he didn't uh, make any distinction between uh, paintings from photographs and paintings that he composed. He simply uh, uh, used what was available and uh, worked toward uh, a, a whole uh, collection of paintings that reflected uh, of the Mexican community here in San Antonio in the 19th century. So these, uh, 
So I think that he even wrote, uh, he even wrote a little uh, treatise on how to copy from photographs, even uh, had his, his initials on it. He was happy to share it with other people and with his students. And finally, I just wanted to show uh, that in spite of all of the uh, rigors of the school and, and what they were taught and what he, he learned, these are examples of the first of his work uh, after he came to Texas. They're the, probably the first exi existing drawings that he did, and uh, they're, they're not of the Mexican community that, that he was so uh, attracted to later, but they're of his fellow colonists, the fellow adventurers from Castroville, as they were looking for another town site for Henry Castro to settle. And as you can see, they're very, um, uh, they have a lot of energy, they're lively little paintings, little scribbles, but he was also careful that they didn't spill over into each other. This, this is one, one side of a sheet, the other side has a, uh, six little drawings on it too. This is probably about six by eight inches in, in, in size. And, and these are just uh, more of the little, little drawings that he did. This was in 1847. And then he refined a few of them. This, this goes way back to, <laughs> to the lessons. <laughs> Sorry. But, okay. And, and this is a, a familiar name to people in San Antonio connected with uh, uh, Incarnate Word, I think, uh, the Earthlines. This is Poinsard who was on one of those little uh, journeys to try to find another town site. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's it, okay. <laughs> about five or so minutes for questions. So if anybody has questions, I'll bring you the mic. Martha, I was wondering, it, since the family owned so many works, what did Jean Thiel do to earn a living? Because it, it doesn't seem like he did this for commissions and was paid for his work. So what did he do? He, he taught. He taught at uh, St. Mary's Institute. He taught boys uh, for 30 years at St. Mary's in San Antonio, downtown San Antonio. Okay. And and he did some. Uh, still did some surveys at first. He was doing some surveys for friends, just uh, surveys of lots and uh, that sort of thing. Can you but, can you give us a sense of? How many items are going to be included in the catalog raisonné? What, 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 how many are you up to in terms of the number items, of works? How many items do you think you'll have in the catalog raisonné? I think it's uh, probably 530, something like that. <laughs> Get it done, Martha. <laughs> other questions? Martha, when, I, when we last met, you were looking for more works by Gentile.
Can you tell us uh, perhaps some anecdotes about how you've discovered more? Oh. <laughs> I, you know, the, the big collections, uh, I think, uh, well, Cecilia, Cecilia was one of the people who would sort of pass on uh, names when, when people came to her and they had Jean Teal paintings, she would, she would pass on the names um, because uh, there are s some out of town that we still haven't found, uh, and some that, uh, that other relatives had. The, the family here was limited, really. He didn't have a family of his own. Uh, this, uh, in, in town, it was uh, his sister's family, primarily. And, uh, but he had a brother, and the brother settled elsewhere. Uh, and uh, so that family still has possibly some additional paintings, yeah. I have one over here. Okay. I was just gonna say, Martha, just thanks so much. I mean, okay. uh, to say, I mean I, every time I think I've seen everything this guy's done, you show more in the landscape. Okay. Just, I mean, it's just incredible. So okay. I've seen kind of a preview of the catalog resonating raw, okay. it's just gonna be fantastic, so thank you. I don't know. We'll see. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for Amy. I, as yes. she knows, I've long been fascinated with Miss Underdog's career. Do you know, did she continue to paint and do miniatures after she started her curatorial career? And if she didn't, did she ever express any regrets about that? So she does continue to paint but she seems to do it much more for her own personal enjoyment. And what I find fascinating is she would do these beautiful detailed miniatures uh, and her ability in portraiture um, in that miniature scale is, is incredible. I mean, her father was a, a portrait artist who was incredibly skilled and she carried a lot of that talent in her. But one of the pieces that she's doing later for her own enjoyment, they're, they're very loose, they're very quick, uh, they're, they're, they're little scenes and just sort of small scale. Um, she also would do work for um, occasionally as like contributing to a fundraiser. And so there are some Whiplock prints that she did to, to contribute. So she keeps, she sort of continues to have the artistic expression, but she's no longer exhibiting. She's no longer trying to uh, sort of pursue that as a career. She really focuses on um, presenting work as a curator and in nurturing the careers of others. Any further questions? Time for one more. Okay. Right. Well, yeah, so, uh, okay. We, we all, uh, we are counting the, the moments that your catalog resume is done and the work that you've done is so gargantuan. So thank you so much for sharing your insights today. I, I learn something new every time I t we hear you, so thank you. Amy, of course, will continue the great work of Chief Curator. I didn't know, I acknowledge that Amy, um, all the paintings that are in that gallery, Amy um, personally figured out how to get, there, get them here, including uh, driving our brand new art van to go pick them up. So thank you, Amy. <laughs>